And hello, I'm Kelly Dumar with the International Women's Writing Guild. I'm on the board and I'm the lucky person who has the opportunity to host our bi-monthly open mic and to be here with you today to welcome all of you, our, our, everyone from around the world who is here to either read or listen today. And we really thank you for coming. And um, I'm so excited today because in addition to our open mic readers that we're going to have, first up, we're going to hear from Andrine Bonner, longtime International Women's Writing Guild member, author, teacher extraordinaire. Um, so we're excited to hear what it, Andrine wants to share with us today. And after she reads for about 10 minutes, we are going to have a chance to give some question and answer and discussion of her work. And so I encourage you, if you have a particular question for Andrine, a comment, please put it in the chat room. We'll do our best to, I'll do my best to get to those questions um, after she does her reading. And I wanna mention that I'm excited for a, a lot of reasons why we have Andrine here today, but very excited about her topic, which sounded um, a little unusual to me. It's a term that she herself has coined, literacy fiction. And that's what she's going to be reading to us today and referring to her passion, her uh, mission, which is to promote and engage literacy. And we're gonna be looking at uh, and hearing from Andrine about her concepts of how literacy equals identity. And um, it occurs to me that um, the reason we're all here together, why we gather in this guild, why this guild exists, why we come here to be together in our open mic and in our community is that um, literacy matters to every single one of us. We all learned to read and um, how different our lives, our creative lives, our lives would be if we didn't ever learn to read. And so I'm excited to take on this topic as Andrine frames it for us. And I think uh, I'll just start with, before I introduce her, I wanted to read a quote um, from Kofi Annan about literacy. Literacy is a bridge from misery to hope. It is a tool for daily life in modern society. It is a bulwark against poverty and a building block of development, an essential complement to investments in roads, dams, clinics, and factories. Literacy is a platform for democratization and a vehicle for the promotion of cultural and national identity, especially for girls and women. It is an agent of family health and nutrition for everyone everywhere. Literacy is along with education in general, a basic human right. Literacy is finally the road to human progress and the means through which every man, woman and child can realize his or her full potential. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Absolutely. So <laughs> I want to tell you a little bit about Andreen. Um, and she is she grew up in Kingston, Jamaica with her parents and four siblings. And she's an educator, a playwright, and an author of a literacy fiction series, four nonfiction books about student resilience and full length cultural dramas on African American and Caribbean history. She's the founder of Literacy Gateway Institute where she develops curricula, wellness tools, and offers training on the parent-teacher partnership and co-teaching. Her poetry has been featured in several publications, including the Caribbean writer and Kapu Sens. She is a contributing poet to the upcoming anthology celebrating the renowned Jamaican folklorist and poet, Dr. Louise Bennett Co Coverley. And she holds advanced degrees in English language, literacy, and theater. She is an alumna of the Lincoln Center Educational Learning Labs for Artists and Educators. She served on the board of the Los Angeles Women's Theater Festival and currently serves on the board of the Caribbean American Repertory Theater West. She is a member of the International Women's Writing Guild. Welcome and thank you for coming, Andrine. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here. 
I'm so much more excited that I got the opportunity to, to find community with IWWG. Uh, well, so, uh, we're so glad you are ready. Why don't you introduce, and this is your time to go, so please go forth. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Okay, I, so I, I, I want to talk a little bit about um, literacy as identity, because I feel that literacy uh, feeds identity and both are intrinsically linked uh, to the way society views itself and governs itself in the world. So when someone is able to read and understand what they read, the world then opens up to them. And that's where my passion lies right now. Um, working with those persons who need to access literacy. So let me tell you how I define that term um, that Kelly uh, presented to you early on, literacy uh, fiction. Well, once upon a time in subcultures, just to write a little X, that was, that was literacy. You know, that rendered them literate. Then, then they said, you know, maybe if you learn to read and write, you're literate. Well, I say it's that and more. It is the ability to understand and transfer the knowledge across discipline. It's about understanding money, one's responsibility to the environment, sexuality, science, mathematics, one's own identity, and, and, and ultimately, what I like to see a happen in my classroom is an appreciation uh, for the liberating power of language and literature in all of its forms. So in my classroom, not everyone enjoys reading. You know, here's how I, I help students who, for example, let me give you a, a little bit of example here. A student who loves sports, but just hates to read. And I have quite a few star athletes that I have taught in my day. And I, I was able to get them to access literature by reading and writing about sports. That's what they love. That's where they enter. I just completed a soon to be published book of short plays about sports uh, for, for young actors to encourage engagement in reading. Well, I taught my star athletes the same analytical strategies that I was teaching those who were actually absorbing Shakespeare and Moliere and August Wilson. Those students who were experiencing the joy of language and culture, usually somebody else's culture in, in the classroom. Uh, and I taught another program in which parents and grandparents and, uh, and guardians and their children are learning in the same classroom. I teach parents the same strategies that the children are supposed to be um, exposed to in their classroom. I help the parents and guardians to, but to connect them with the, what I consider the familiar. So, for example, I remember watching a 76 year old guardian light up when I, I taught her characterization. And she was able to connect it to her favorable, favorite Bible stories and her favorite Bible personalities. And she got it, she got it. She had not been in school since she was 11 years old. You know, life took her down a, a different path. And, and so she understood the stories and that is where she entered. So I chose literary fiction to situate my two books, Long Walk to Cherry Gardens and No Life in Olympic Gardens. I have taken license to teach literacy through these, the storytelling in these books. And I use the same literary elements and techniques to create, create the meaning. So both the boy and the girl, here's the success story, both the boy who loves sports and hates literature, and the adult who only knew her, her Bible by reciting uh, verses, 
they both experience success in the classroom. And here's a little brata, and in my culture, we call brata a little extras. I made the adult parent who had not been in school for 11, 11 years, uh, since she was 11 years old. I allowed her to use her Jamaican patwa to decode and to analyze and to connect with, with, with the language, with, with literature. And I made her understand that English language uh, intersected with um, German and the Norman French in as much as, as, as her Jamaican native Patois um, also intersected with the African and the European cultures. And that made her light up. She, she was very excited about her and about it. And that is what I consider identity when you are able to, to use your own language to navigate your way through the world. Um, and you know, if you know, I, I learned this, that if you don't know how you are oppressed, you can free yourself. And that's the truth. So on the subject of identity, it was Paul, Paula Freire who said, um, without a sense of identity, there can be no real struggle. And I say along with, you know, the rice and peas and the cook up rice and the oxtail and the, and the curry goat and the roti, the Caribbean has language, we have stories, we have history, we have the visual arts, we have culture. And that is what I call literacy. And that is what I call identity. And so Roderick is developing, Roderick being the main protagonist in the story, He's developing his skills as a visual artist. He paints the stories of his life on stones and he's also sculpting. So, all right, I'm gonna go quickly into some of the reading because I, I want us to be able to talk a little bit more about it. Um, again, the story is unfolding. It started out in the garrison uh, an emerging garrison, Olympic Gardens, and that's where the first book starts. And then it continues in, in Cherry Gardens, which is an affluent part of, of Jamaica. At, at this time of the story, the life of the story, Jamaica was newly independent. And so it was defining itself. It still is defining itself. And music was uh, an integral part of the culture. So the 60s music, um, the music of resistance, told the stories of, of the oppression of black folks and uh, by the ruling class and the mulattoes and, and, the, the, and the haves and, and rude boy culture was emerging. So Roderick was listening to um, the slickers who are singing, um, you know, Johnny, you're too bad, or Alton Ellis. Oh, I love me some Alton. Ooh, I get all goosebumps when I think about Alton Ellis. And then Derek Morgan and don't, you know, Rudy Got Soul and Toots and the Metals and Jimmy Cliff and Bob Marley and the Whalers were chanting down Babylon system, you know? So that's that's the setting for the story um, as it as it unfolds in these in these these two. The first two of the trilogy, I'm actually working on the, the last body of work, okay? So Cesar Chavez said that once social, social, social change begins, it cannot be reversed. And you cannot uneducate the person who has learned to read. You cannot humiliate the person who feels pride and you cannot oppress people who are not afraid anymore. And that it is in the, 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 the meal, you know, that I am defining Roderick's life here through education, lack of education, humiliation. He was stomped all over his dignity and, and secretly they were hiding his identity, the son of a white American 
sailor man and an African Jamaican woman. And now he is now raised in a cauldron of secrets where people are too ashamed of themselves. So I, I am just going to start sharing from book one and let you know where the story started. I'm gonna read from Olympic Gardens and the story kicks off. Roderick is very innovative and he was out in the yard playing and you know making his little toy carts you know, from uh, recycled materials uh, in the yard. And so here we go. About a quarter of a mile along the way from Content Farms, a man pulled up beside his mother's and his sister, who Roderick had accidentally flung from the cart and hurt the little girl. Upon Mara Bell's return from the clinic, Roderick got a beating so fierce. So much so, the neighbors cried shame on her actions. Maribel claimed that Roderick was a spiteful child because he didn't like playing with his sister. In her mind, there was no possibility of an accident. For every belt lash, she lambasted him with her tongue. You are as wicked as your father. I would rather see your grave than send you to school one more day. As a matter of fact, I am sending you to go live with your aunt, Open Kingston. And when she tired of you, she can give you a way to make good for nothing, Sister Lillian. Uh, she lives free like a bird, for she don't have no picnic to tie up our foot. You won't cause any more problems for me and my husband and my new children you will be better off doing bolo work. This was the kind of goat mouth that Marabel often wished on the boy, a pessimistic life of servitude. That night, Roderick's father, Mr. Cupidon, found him asleep between the tombstones and the small family burial ground near the roadside. People said that his mother took out her rage on the child because she hated swagger boy Brithwit, Roderick's biological father, who had left her at the altar to go serve in the Navy overseas. Well, that depends on who was telling this story. Marabelle grumbled all night. You ungrateful little wretch. God know why I'm shut up some woman womb. Her rage shuttered between personal hurt and righteous indignation. She packed Roderick's clothes, a small sack of red peas, dried yams, cake soap, chew sticks to clean his teeth. A wash rag and the oldest towel she could find, so thin there were hardly any more wear in it. As she paced the house, her husband tried to reason with her amid the aisle. Belle, I believe that a little more exposure to Sabbath school will turn the boy around. No response. Her temper was as hot as a coal pot with burning embers so intense, iron would melt. So that's how the story kicks off. And she sends Roderick away to Kingston to live with her sister. Then I want to read for you how um, Roderick is using the different, how the different forms of, of literacy are unfolding in the story. So academic li literacy, Roderick was yearning, yearning to go to school and his aunt would not allow him to go to school. She denied him an educator. He wanted to, to be like the other children he was seeing in town. I mean, hey, as far as he was concerned, he was a schoolboy in his mind. It's, it's kind of like, reminds me of Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth and Nanya the Maroons, Kojo. You could not tell them that they were slaves. 
And that's the spirit that was, that was inside of Roderick as young as he was. He was no shop boy. He was a schoolboy. The Easter school term, and I'm reading now from book two as the story progresses, was almost over and there was no sign that Roderick's aunt would permit him to attend school. Roderick took matters into his own hands without his auntie knowing his plans. Roderick got dressed in his school uniform and new brown shoes. He rolled an exercise book like a funnel and stuck it in his back pocket. He placed a pencil behind his ear, jumped through the secret window and made his way towards perennial primer school. Me not doing no yard work today. Me going to school all by myself. If I don't go, auntie will keep me lock up like shop boy. I will deal with the beating when me come home. I am going to school. Roderick walked to school after waiting for a while and a bus didn't arrive. Upon entering the school compound, he noticed the children were moving swiftly to their classroom. Roderick loitered outside a classroom window. He chose at random, listened to the teacher and the children engage in lively debates and storytelling. Visualizing himself sitting at a desk, surrounded by cheerful children, he became lost in his daydream. He heard the teacher telling the class how proud she was that they came prepared with their end of term projects. They ranged from reciting poetry by Jamaican poets to telling stories about people and places of historical value to a newly independent country. He crouched behind the huge metal window that rolled outwards and hid behind it so that the teacher could not see him. Roderick listened attentively to a boy around his age recite. The boy bowed from his waist down, straightened himself, chin up, looked ahead without blinking and clasped palms against his chest. If we must die by Claude McKay. If we must die, let it not be like hogs, hunted and penned in an inglorious spot while round about us bark the mad and do hungry dogs, making their mock at our accursed lot. If we must die, oh, let us nobly die so that our precious blood may not be shed in vain then even the monsters we defy shall be constrained to honor us, though dead. Oh, kinsmen, we must meet the common foe. Though far outnumbered, let us show us brave and for their thousand blows deal one death blow. What though before us lies the open grave, like men, we'll face the murderous, cowardly pact pressed to the wall, dying, but fighting back. Roderick held on to every word the little boy recited. Financial literacy, very important. This is Babylon system, chapter 19. The mid-afternoon sun was blinding and the wind blew the dust into a ferocious spin. Roderick was taking a much needed break from studying at the studying as he sat on the piazza with Miss Dillon. The campaigning for the upcoming general elections to choose the next prime minister had started only three years after the present government won the election on 21 February, 1967. Flatbed trucks with men and women on loudspeakers crawled through the town that Friday, inviting the people to a meeting in the square. Tonight, tonight, at all roads lead to Bay Farm Road, 
come out in your hundreds, come out in your thousands. Here, your party leader lay out a plan for a progress in the next election. <laughs> you hear that, Miss Dillon? They want an election. Tell me about this election thing. When you turn 21 year old, you get to choose who you want to be the leader of your country. It's kind of like the headmaster at your school. So you vote for that person. Oh, Miss Dillon, me have a long way to reach 21. Yes, but you can still pay attention to what is going on in Olympic Gardens. You, you can help out too. I hear them calling into the radio station about the same thing. But Miss Dillon, why do people then sound so angry? them fed up of the foolishness going on in the government. Some have it and some don't have it. We can't afford to take care of our families. Times are getting harder, not better. I know it's hard for some of we like my friend Jojo, them. Me a suffer right here. That is why me going over to Lich to see if me can sell him and his parents some of my stone art. That's very good. I meant was to ask you, how are you doing with the sale of the second set of stone art I gave you, Miss Dillon? It is going very well. You keep up the good work. I will put all your money together and give it to you. You see, Roderick was an entrepreneur at an early age, which was highly unusual. You know, it was, it was more common to see the little Chinese children whose parents owned shops, you know, um, they would work behind the counter, but the, the African Caribbean, you know, and especially because we're such a class ridden society, you know, the person behind the counter was not highly respected. Although, to be honest, you know, the, the, the shopkeeper was a sacred person, sacred in the community, and so was the shop. The shop was a holy, sacred place. That is where the stories were told. That is where, you know, the shopkeeper became the psychologist to listen and, and to help the community to, to deal with, with the challenges that they're facing, you know, even in their, their, their everyday, the family life or on the jobs, etc. So Roderick was in that kind of community and he was learning uh, financial literacy. He was learning the value of money. Um, and dream, and dream. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna interrupt you here to, mm -hmm. it's hard to interrupt you because your voice is so beautiful and, yeah. uh, there's been, and this has been such a lively reading into Roderick in these two beautiful novels describing this world of his, what I believe you call kind of a rite of passage story into literacy. Yes. And, um, you've given us some really gorgeous writing and some phenomenal storytelling and also some fabulous delivery. And uh, it's really been, it's really enchanting. I'd love to have some time to hear from anybody who's been listening with a question or a comment for you, um, because I just feel Roderick has really already become, started to become alive for us. It has, he has for me as a listener, um, his determination to be seen as, um, to, to select his identity as a school child. This comes across so strongly and movingly in the way you talked about him and then the way that you wrote about him. Um, what a powerful story that he rejects the identity that um, his mother or others might choose for him by denying him school and really seems to know instinctively how he will have to fight for learning to read and knowing instinctively that that is essential part yes. already of his identity. Absolutely. Um, so really powerful. Uh, let me just, I wanna to touch base with a little bit of our listeners who've made some 
comments. Um, uh, Janice Alper says, I can see him sauntering, see Roderick sauntering to school with a notebook in his pocket. Great image. So he really comes alive in this story. Uh, Marisa talks about the incredible sheer persistence of wanting an education is such a huge pull, a longing. Um, the poem, how we're getting to see this protagonist, witness this protagonist, this young boy, be mesmerized by a poet being recited by the school child so that he's seeing what could be his if he is a reader. And um, really pull, yeah, I'm, I, let's see, Judith Falloon writes, I read both books and completely enjoyed them both. Characters so real, great imagery, can't wait for the third in the series. Mar Marty Temkin says, what a voice, memorizing, mesmerizing, <laughs> absolutely. Um, Janice Alper again says, I appreciate how you showed us the culture. Roderick is a wonderful character. Now, Terry has a question. How do you transcribe his voice in the book so that the readers can also appreciate his slang? Well, um, the... Roderick, I, I write most of his, um, especially in the early part of the story, say from book one into the early parts of book two, where he had, uh, he was pretty illiterate, you know, and um, he, he didn't understand the English language very well. He spoke a lot of the Jamaica, his native uh, Jamaican language, which, you know, is popularly known as Patois. And, uh, and so um, that's how he spoke. But as soon as he started to learn to read, you know, he has a little, a little friend um, in a little girl named Chloe, who is a next door neighbor. And uh, she is a pretty middle class and has a lot of books and she gave him access to books. And so he started to, to read books. And, and so the language, the standard English language started to open up to him. Um, so yes, but and how, so, but you, you transcribe his voice. Um, how did you yourself, uh, perhaps portray, how do you portray the language that he's using? Do you write it? You write it as, as slang. You just write his voice phonetically the way it sounds or in. Absolutely. Patois, or I write, I write his, in his voice. I write the language he speaks. I write the, the, the 11 year old's voice, the nine year old's voice. I write that voice. Um, I write how he is interpreting the world, how he is experiencing the world in his language. And boy, is he expressive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, clearly, clearly. And somehow he takes after his, uh, his alter ego, um, the author. Uh, very expressive. So Roderick's mother, Marie. As, as you know, um, Patwa is also uh, it's also a written language. You know, it's it's currently being standardized. So he, you know, he was writing what he understood. Um, in in fact, from uh, he was inventing his own words too. You know, because he goes through that period. He's of a time. poet. He's he's a, he's must be a poet. He's inventing his own words. Absolutely, and he writes songs and poetry. Absolutely. Wonderful. He's an artist. He's an artist. That's where he he finds solace in his art. Um, yes, be beautiful. And I, I want to make a. Uh, Tamara has commented. It is important to note that Jamaican patois is a is a rule governed language that is a mixture of African and other languages. Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Patois is also written in Jamaica, says Faith Nelson. Yeah. Um, and uh, Marisa writes, Roderick, so Roderick's mother's shame is found in her denial of her son's education at his peril. Yet the child is so persistent, it appears as if he is immune to or resilient of his mother's shame. Uh, the motion of shame is a driving factor of fictional, I think she's saying, is the emotional, is the emotion of shame a driving factor of fictional literacy? And are there other emotions that are used in the same way? Um, yes, um, shame drives a lot of, of 
in fact, this story in particular, I can speak to this story. Uh, shame drives this, this story because there is um, the whole idea of um, his mother actually um, sleeping with the white sailor man and having, having a child out of wedlock. And then when she becomes holy and becomes a church girl, you know, so, so that, that is uh, also a very important aspect of, of, of telling the story. You, you, you know, so such a richly imagined story, Andrine. Um, Alicia adds that I think the transition from Creole to standard English that you use for Roderick shows his growth in many aspects. Absolutely, um, absolutely. You know, I once, just he have learned, one... once, he, once he learned to read, there was no turning back for him. The, um, world, the world started to open up for him. Another line you put that I think really speaks to the shame is that he was raised in a cauldron of secrets. Yes. So yes. that really uh, pertains, I think, to the to the shame. Um, and well, there is something, and there is something more sinister, you know, uh, the transgressions of the transgressions of the the adults that the children are asked to fix. They're asked to fix. The adult adults are unwilling to fix themselves. And so the children are burdened with that and are being asked to, to, to fix. Very layered, really layered and really powerful. Um, Andrine, I have put your links into yes. the chat room and as uh, I will use another opportunity too to put them in again, just so that they catch up to um, anybody who's missed them earlier. I wanna put them in, in again. Um, your, reading and your discussion and your sharing your brilliance on this topic um, from all these perspectives has just been really rich, I know, for me and I'm sure for many listening and particularly in this environment where, you know, um, talking to writers, it's uh, clearly um, something that is absolutely desperately close to our hearts. So thank you. Thank you thank so you. much for the beautiful, beautiful reading. And now we're gonna have a chance to um, listen to the readers uh, from around the world and country who are going to be reading their writing today. So I'll invite you to take a look in the chat room, Andrine, yes. and see any other comments that are there that I haven't yet shared with you. You don't wanna miss those. And um, I just really wanna thank you for coming and introducing us to your two beautiful books today. And I, I would like to thank you um, for the invitation and also thank all the listeners and all the, the, the participants today. I'm very excited to get to hear from you as well. Thank you so much. Thank everyone for coming. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and turn off the recording now and the recording will be posted on our YouTube channel and uh, we will be sharing the recording with you in case you want to link to it or, um, or 